Hello, everyone. My name is Adele Fitzgerald, and I am the Electronic Resources Librarian at the Callahan Library at St. Joseph's College in New York. And on behalf of the NASIG Continuing Education Committee, I'd like to welcome you to our October webinar, An Introduction to Counter Usage Reports for Librarians, presented by Lorraine Estelle. Before the presentation, I have a few quick announcements. First, this webinar will be recorded, and anyone who registered for the webinar will receive a link to the recording via email shortly following the webinar. Second, if you have any questions for Lorraine during the presentation, please enter them into the WebEx Q&A box located at the lower corner, the lower right corner of the WebEx window. If you can't see the Q&A box, click on the Q&A icon in the upper right corner of the WebEx window. The Q&A box will then appear in the lower right corner. Lorraine will answer your questions at the end of her presentation. And finally, when the webinar is over, you will be redirected to a survey about the webinar. I hope that you will take a few minutes to fill it out and let us know how we're doing, what we can do better, and share ideas for future webinars. And with that, I will introduce our speaker for today. Lorraine Estelle is the Counter Project Director. Launched in March 2002, COUNTER, which stands for Counting Online Usage of Networked Electronic Resources, is an international initiative serving librarians, publishers, and intermediaries by setting standards, standards that facilitate the recording and reporting of online usage statistics in a consistent, credible, and compatible way. Lorraine is experienced in the information industry with a background in libraries, consortia, shared services, vendors, and publishers. She has managed and conducted a wide range of projects with a particular interest in new business models for electronic information resources and has directed the development of a number of UK national shared services including GIST collections and the journal's usage statistics portal. And now I turn things over to Lorraine. Welcome, Lorraine. Well, thank you very much, Adele. I hope you can hear me OK. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Yes, I'm sorry. I can hear you. Um, OK, great. great. Well, uh, thank you very much, Adele. And thank you also to NASIC for uh, providing this opportunity for me uh, to tell uh, some of your members about counter and our counter reports. Um, before I start the presentation, I just want to credit Anna Franca, who is the Head of Collection Development at King's College London. And Anna developed many of these slides, so I, um, I must acknowledge her contribution and uh, thank her for all her efforts in doing so. So I hope that today's webinar will give you some information about what counter is, why it is important, um, how you get your counter usage reports, I will also try to give an overview of the key report types and then talk a little bit about how you can use the data in the reports uh, for analysis and to inform your decision making. And at the end, I have some links <coughs> uh, to uh, further help and support, which I, I, I hope will be useful to you. I think uh, in her introduction, Adele uh, read out this uh, description of the purpose of, of COUNTER. And very much we are the organization, the membership organization, which establishes the code of practice to facilitate the recording, exchange, interpretation of online usage statistics. Our code of practice is an open and international standard and is used internationally for the provision of consistent, credible and compatible usage statistics. Uh, and I'll come back to those three C words uh, in, in a moment and talk a little bit more about what we mean by them. But first of all, uh, a little bit of the background uh, on counter. 
Uh, counter is a collaboration. It is a collaboration between publishers, librarians, vendors, intermediaries. And a group of them got together in March 2002, uh, seeing the need for uh, the whole industry to have reliable usage statistics that were compatible and credible, and set about launching Counter. And now Counter is the international initiative that sets the standard uh, for usage statistics. And we continue to be supported by our, our group of stakeholders uh, who all play a part in the information environment, publishers, intermediaries, librarians. And we'll hear a bit more about them as we, as we go on. So I have already mentioned the three Cs. We love the three Cs in Counter. Consistent. Uh, if you're going to have usage statistics that are of use to you, they must be consistent from year to year. The metric types must be consistent. And the rules for counting must be consistent. The uh, usage reports must be credible. They must eliminate uh, double clicks, robotic use, and so on. And very important, and this is uh, the thing about a standard, they must be comparable. When you receive reports from one publisher, they must be comparable uh, with those reports from another publisher so that you can really understand the value of the resources that you subscribe to. So that is what our objective is, to achieve those three Cs in terms of the counting of usage and reporting to libraries. The uh, first code of practice was published uh, in 2003, uh, and that covered journals and databases. In 2006, uh, reports were added for books and reference work. And we are now considered the gold standard for measuring usage in, in, in our environment. Release 4, that's the current release of, of the counter code of practice, is now a single integrated code of practice covering journals, databases, books, and multimedia. Uh, I would just <coughs> say here, while we're talking about the releases, we are currently working on the development of release five of the counter code of practice. And, and you will hear a lot from us uh, in the beginning of next year when we seek your feedback and input on that new release. Uh, the new release will, uh, one of the features of it is that it will go down, not just to title level, but to item level in terms of articles and so on. But back to release four, where we are at the moment. Who is involved in Counter? Well, Counter, as I said to you, <coughs> is a membership organization. And our board, our committees, our groups are all made up of members of Counter. And we have three main uh, committees uh, that help us in our work. The first is our board of directors. And the directors are really there to ensure the governance of Counter, that we serve our members properly, that we manage our finances, uh, and act in a proper way. And, and that's very important because our finances come from you in terms of your membership fees. Uh, we have a wonderful uh, director of our board, Oliver Pesh from EBSCO. Uh, and not only does he provide uh, governance in, in terms of his role as chair, but he's very active in the development of the Council Code of Practice and indeed the SUSHI protocol, which we'll talk about uh, a little later. We have an executive committee who really are the day-to-day -day group looking at the development of the standard uh, and ensuring the policies and processes uh, for compliance. And that group is chaired by David Summer. Uh, some of you may know him because he is one of the directors of Kudos. <clears throat> and we also have the most amazing technical advisory group, very, very clever, very committed people working on the development of counter uh, and many of them also involved in the development of um, sushi. 
and Paul Needham from the University of Cranfield is chair of that group. And I must say, I think I would be sunk without the technical uh, advice that Paul uh, provides. So, um, but great thanks to all of them and the and the members of their group. I would say that just before we move on, that all members of Counter are eligible to serve on our groups. And as vacancies arise, we will look to the membership for, for new members. So I hope you are members of Counter. Uh, if not, please do become so. And again, if you are interested in becoming more involved, we really very happy to hear from you. Well, why, why in 2002 did those uh, librarians, vendors and publishers get together? And why do we keep going? Why is Counter important? Well, as I've said, it enables the like-for-like -like comparison of usage statistics from different publishers. We hope and aim to produce reports which are easy to understand, that do not require a great deal of expertise to understand. <clears throat> we aim that the reports uh, provide data that can be easily manipulated and analyzed. So well, why does all that matter? I think it's all about value. It's about understanding the value of the resources that you are subscribing to. And although not the whole picture by any means, um, usage statistics play quite a role in the e-resource life cycle. You acquire your resources and you make them accessible to your users. And then you will always have a period of evaluation, reviewing the value, reviewing the, the use, and your decision to renew or cancel. And, and that's really where counter plays a very important uh, part in that evaluation uh, process. As we will see uh, later on, of course, um, usage isn't everything, but it is an important component in understanding the value. Why do librarians need it? Well, you all know, I don't have to tell you, uh, the great investments that you are making in, in your subscriptions to electronic resources. Uh, you have to understand that you are getting value for, for money. But you, as librarians, are also asked to demonstrate your impact and value. And again, I think that usage statistics can help in, in, in that demonstration. There is a, an increasing focus, I think, all over the world on student satisfaction. And again, use of statistics, just a tiny part of, of, the, of that, but they can tell us something about whether students are getting, <coughs> using the information that, that you are providing, or, or indeed if they're not able to get the information they require to support their studies. As we said, uh, very important in considering cancellations and renewal decisions, and of course, reporting. Uh, reporting at the consortia level, and that's very important, of course, uh, and also to senior management within your institutions. Uh, one of the most frequent requests I get uh, are for, is for information about how to get the usage reports. Uh, usually from a, from a librarian who's in a terrible rush and has been asked to provide some information. There are two ways that you can retrieve your reports. You can retrieve them manually, and most publishers and vendors have a, an area on their website where you can log in and draw down your reports. Or, uh, and you can request a report by email from the vendor or publisher. Now, it must be said that this manual retrieval of uh, usage reports is very time consuming, very repetitive process, probably not the best use of your time. And this is why we work very closely with NISO on the Sushi Standard Usage Harvesting Initiative. Uh, not raw fish, but uh, the, the protocol for automating the collection of usage statistics into local systems. So a machine-to-machine -machine system. <clears throat> and it 
replaces the time-consuming user-mediated collection. And Sushi works with, with a number of systems, uh, ERMs, uh, and for example, 360 counter, use stats, and so on. Uh, we are also uh, developing at the moment, uh, with funding from the EBSCO Foundation, a, a, a tool, or not free online tool, for the testing of Sushi. So do, do listen out, because we will, ho I hope, <laughs> shortly uh, be announcing uh, that free tool. But the important thing about Sushi is it frees up librarians' time, and it means that rather than spending your time downloading reports from publishers or from, from their emails, you can focus on the important analysis uh, and evaluation. Now, <clears throat> in Counter Release 4, we have optional reports, which, which some publishers can provide if they want to. But we have a set of standard reports. And the ones I'm going to focus on here today are the, the most used. Our journal reports, our database reports, and our book reports. Journal report one, uh, the number of successful full text article requests by month and journal, is the most used of all the counter reports. Very, very important and, and used by libraries uh, all over the world. We also have been released for the GOA uh, report. And this reports on the successful gold open access full text article requests. And that's increasingly important for libraries, both to um, evaluate if, if they're paying for article processing charges uh, in their institution to, to see the use of that, but also so that they can deduct gold open access uses from the subscription uses when, when they're doing cost per download analysis. Uh, we were talking about student satisfaction for a moment. Uh, a moment ago, and our turnaway re reports, uh, general report two, is a very important report in terms of understanding where access has been denied to your users, either because um, you do not have a license to the content they want to access, or in some cases because there is a limit on the concurrent access, and that report will give you that information. Uh, our data report, uh, sorry, database report, very similar, total use, access denied, and our platform report, total searches, result clicks, record views, by month and by platform. And then we have our book reports, and again we have the successful uh, title request. That's in book report one, and book report one is about requests for books which are created as a single file and can only be downloaded as a whole book. Book report two uh, looks at requests, successful requests by section, so that section could be a chapter or an article in a reference work. Again, we have the access denied uh, reports, which again, very useful for understanding uh, where there is demand for content that you may not be providing. And the book for five total searches by month and title. So those are our standard reports. Now, I'm going to delve down a bit and have a look at some of them in a bit more detail. <clears throat> As I said, general report one, JR1, number of, number of successful full text article requests by month and journal is the most used uh, and valuable of all the reports. And this is an example of one uh, for you to have a look at if you're not familiar with them. And as you can see, uh, the report will be run to cover a period. And the one we're looking at is the period for the whole of 2015. Uh, there are a number of identifiers. We have the journal DOI. If it exists, as you can see, there's a few fields there that are blank. The print ISSN and the online SSN, the unique journal identifier. And in the next column, along from the online ISSN, we have the reporting period total. And that is the sum of the HTML successful requests and the PDF downloads. 
Um, and then we have usage, as you can see, broken down uh, by by month. And that's quite useful for looking at spikes and um, periods of, of high use. And there are some reasons why you might want to, to, to look at that in particular, which I will talk about in a moment. Our database reports, as you will see, that's the same format as the journal reports. Um, and here, the example we're looking at, it, we're looking at the same. Um, I, I, so I've just seen that comment about 1A. I'll, I'll come back to that later. Uh, the database reports, um, same format, uh, but a little bit different. You will have the uh, subscribe databases, the publisher platform, and then the metric types, the user activity, the type of activity. Regular searches, searches federated and automated, result clicks, and record views. In terms of user activity, what we're really interested in are the regular searches, the result clicks, and the record views. The federated and automated uh, searches are of interest, but, but they can be rather misleading because they're machine generated. Now, many of us get uh, quite um, perplexed, I suppose, by result clicks and record views. And I could really spend the whole time talking about those two metrics. Um, they are important because, as I say, it's about user actions, not uh, machine actions. And at the end of the uh, presentation, I will point you to some further resource which helps explain in more detail those two metrics. Uh, our book reports, again, as you see, the same format, which is which is very important. Uh, and very similar, we have the book titles, publisher, platform, in this case it's EBSCO host, uh, ISBN, and so on. And again, reporting broken down um, by month, and then the total for the reporting period. As I said, the thing about report one is it is only for book titles that are downloaded uh, as an entirety. The whole book downloads when a user requests it. Book report two. Oh, oh dear. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Bit of a delay there. Book report two is the report for books which are available in sections. Now, the um, as you will see there, it says type of section. And in this case, we're talking about a book chapter. And it is the responsibility of the vendor or publisher to describe what they mean by section. In the case of reference works, for example, it could be a, an article. It can actually sometimes be a page. Most typically, you will see uh, that that it is a chapter. Um, so to, I can fit this in. I've hidden a few, few uh, columns here. But you can see, again, we have the same format, title, publisher, platform, ISBN, ISSN, if it's there, reporting period, uh, and um, usage by month. There are a couple of points to note, and that is that count reports can show all the usage for all titles on a particular platform or in a particular package. Now, there is some inconsistency across different vendors on how they can report. So you may see zero usage for titles that you do not actually subscribe to. They may appear on that JR1 report. Equally, uh, you might see usage for titles that you do not subscribe to if they are open access and they are on the publisher's platform. Now, in terms of gold open access, uh, you can deduct deduct the gold open access journal report from the main report. But it can be quite time consuming 
to uh, filter out the uh, other open access works. And in our new release of Counter, we will be uh, adding the metric type for for access. You know, is it gold, open access, green, etc. Uh, but at the moment, you have to be aware of that. Some publishers, as I say, can narrow down the reports so that you only see the titles in your package, but others will be giving you everything on their platform. So, so something to be aware to be aware of. So having got all your data, what are you going to do with it? Uh, great, you've got the report. And you can use the reports uh, to evaluate at the title level or at the package level. And here we have some uh, examples of how you can use it. And in this example, uh, we, we are talking about a particular uh, title, the Journal of Statistics, you'd be surprised to hear. Uh, and it's uh, subscribed to at a particular institution. And we can look at the total uh, use in over a period of three years. And in this example, <coughs> we can see that usage of this title is actually decreasing. And that's the sort of thing that would make us stop and think about that title. Is it value? Uh, do we have to think about it? Do we have to cancel it? And of course, a lot will depend on the context of that title and how you're paying for it. In this example, <coughs> the Journal of Statistics is part of a package with 40 other titles from a particular publisher. They're calling it Package C. And again, we can look at the same at the usage across all the 40 titles in that package across the three years. And we can see that uh, in 2015, uh, the use was 7,798, um, which, which is an increase on the previous years. So we might conclude that that particular title isn't too much of a problem because overall we're getting good use of the package. But we might want to look at the cost per use uh, to help us in that evaluation. Uh, I must point out here uh, that I, there is a bit of an error. I've used the wrong figure here. On the line there, it says £15,000. Sorry, that should be dollars. So we're looking at that package of 40, 40, title, uh, 40 titles, package C, which cost the institution $15,000 in subscription fees. And as we saw, the total usage for that year was 7,798 full text downloads. So we can divide the subscription fee by the usage, and that gives us $1.3 uh, as the cost per download. So overall, we might say that this package represents fairly good value for money, even though one or two of the titles uh, may not be performing as well as they did. Uh, there are a few points, of course, to consider when we're, when we're looking at cost per use. Cost per use analysis can be, form, can be performed on any subscription, and it can be at the package level and it can be at the title level. But you need those two ingredients, the cost and the usage. Cost per use can indicate if a resource is value for money, uh, but there are caveats, of course. Um, you do have to be aware of the long tail, uh, the big deal, big package of titles versus the individual subscriptions. And libraries need to think about that in terms of whether they keep a big deal or revert to individual subscriptions. Clearly, if one or two titles are making up the, the bulk of your, your use in a big deal, then you're going to be, want to be thinking about whether the other titles are giving you and your users value. As I mentioned, your reports will include use of open access titles. Now, you can deduct them when you're 
calculating cost per use. Uh, and perhaps that's quite an important thing to do. Otherwise, it's going to give you a rather distorted picture of the value of what you are paying for. And I also think that when we look at cost per use, we must remember that value is subjective and it can vary across disciplines and at different institutions. So, for instance, we, we will often find that titles in the humanities, in the arts, will have a completely different pattern and level of use when we compare them with titles in the sciences. Um, so context is really important when we're looking at, at value. And we need to benchmark like, like with like to get a picture of that. <clears throat> so there are drawbacks. Uh, Low usage doesn't necessarily indicate low value and vice versa. And again, I would, I would say particularly in the humanities and the arts, you would typically see a lower usage uh, when compared to the other disciplines. It doesn't mean that those uh, titles are not having high impact in, in those disciplines. Um, the other thing to remember about county usage reports is that they're telling you about downloads, really. They don't tell you what somebody does with that. And we have all done it, I'm sure. Uh, we download something with good intentions, but then we don't read it. So uh, we have to be mindful of that. Conversely, um, and we did some research last year with uh, Carol Tanapier uh, and the cyber team into life beyond downloads. And that research showed us that some articles are shared many, many times once they are downloaded. Sharing by email being the, 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 most, um, the most common use, but uh, other uses as well. Uh, so again, an article downloaded may have much more uh, uses than we're ever going to be aware of. We, we can only look at downloads from platforms in terms of counter. And of course, when we were talking, for example, about those book downloads, those chapter downloads, some will be very long, others might be relatively short. So again, it doesn't really tell us, uh, very, well, it doesn't tell us anything about that. One thing I will talk about, and, and I think it's something that you need to look at uh, in your usage reports, are spikes that can inflate overall usage figures. Now, in the counter code of practice, we say that publishers must eliminate uh, robotic use from the usage statistics that you get. And we publish on our website a list of the known robots and crawlers. But uh, robots come and go quite, quite, uh, quite frequently. And sometimes they are very uh, discipline specific. So for example, recently, uh, a library noticed a big spike in their usage uh, for chemistry journals. And their chemistry faculty were sending out robots that were doing systematic downloading. Uh, we were able to resolve that with the publisher, and that usage was removed from the reports once we knew uh, that that robot was doing that work. And also, that robot was added to our list. But if you do see spikes, um, it is always worth contacting the publisher or vendor to double check that there isn't some um, robotic reason for it. And of course, the other uh, drawback is uh, to remember is that titles do transfer during the reporting period. So uh, sometimes they, the use will disappear because the journal has, has moved. So there are drawbacks, even, even the best of standards. But standards are important because otherwise we are comparing uh, the famous apples and oranges. One of the great challenges for counter and indeed for, for libraries is that there is no obligation for vendors to sign up to counter. Signing up to counter uh, costs them money uh, because they have to implement the system on their platform, and we insist that they are audited each year by an independent auditor, and they have to pay the auditor. Um, so 
some vendors uh, may provide you with non-counter-compliant usage statistics. If they do, you have to remember there is no standard governing how they do that. In the counter code of practice, we ensure that double clicks are eliminated, that robotic use is eliminated, but non-counter compliance statistics can be packaged and presented in any way that the vendor chooses. And they are not audited. There is no check that they are accurate. And of course, if you're trying to compare non-counter compliance stats with uh, counter stats, that's very difficult because the formats will be different and so on. So I would really encourage you, if you, if you have non-compliant publishers, uh, encourage them to become counter members and encourage them to be counter compliant. And we have uh, guides for them to help them become compliant. We are developing a free tool that they can use, uh, which will be great, <coughs> great help to them. So I think um, consumer uh, desire for counter usage reports really does help. Oops. But as much as I, I talk about the usage reports and the importance of counter, of course, usage is just one way that you can assess the value of your electronic resource subscriptions. It is important to remember that there are other factors at play. As I mentioned, niche and specialist resources sometimes have quite low uh, download figures. Uh, for example, in the case of historic books, um, a download of two or three historic books may uh, be the primary source material for somebody's um, dissertation. So they've made three downloads, but they, they've then gone away for three years working on those texts. So low downloads uh, doesn't always mean low impact. Changes to teaching and research in your institution will impact on the pattern of usage. Uh, of course, Sometimes that means that use uh, declines, but it can also uh, mean that suddenly there is demand for something that you aren't subscribing to. And that is where those turnaway reports are really helpful, uh, seeing content that users want and cannot access. Another impact <coughs> are the discovery solutions that you implement in your um, library. And sometimes, uh, in some cases, you may actually see use uh, reducing when you introduce a, a new discovery solution. Now, that may not necessarily be the bad thing it looks at first sight. It may be that your discovery solution is very good, uh, giving high relevance in the search, and therefore, users are not going into so many resources as they once would have had to, to find the content that they need. And of course, changes in the wider environment also impact as well. So we would always say treat usage data with caution and view alongside the other qualitative data that you will be, be gathering about your users and their needs. Well, we're getting, we're getting close to the end of the presentation, but I, I do want to just remind everybody that if we want to count accurately, and you see here we're counting in metric and imperial, uh, but in a consistent way, then we need standards. And, and that's where we feel that counter adds value by, by providing the standard for the famous three C's. Um, I will just point you to some places where you can get further information and help uh, about usage statistics and understanding them. Our website, of course, uh, is, is one source of help, and you can follow us on Twitter as well. If you are interested or you're working on Sushi, then the NISO website will be a great help to you, and that's where you will find the sushi protocol and uh, information about it. Association of Research Libraries, 
statistics and assessment area, again, another great source of um, help for librarians. USIS. Now, I hope that you are um, all aware of USIS. Uh, this is a counter-funded uh, website where we try and resolve issues for the library community that they might find with counter uh, reports. If you do have a, an issue, a problem, or you spot something um, you think is not quite right, do report it through USIS. We have the usage, sorry, the users steering group who will look into it. We will talk to the vendor or publisher for you and work with them to resolve the problem. Uh, so yeah, do do have a look at uses. I highly recommend it. I mentioned that we have some guides on our website. We have library guides. Uh, we have uh, guide to journal reports. Uh, we have guide to, uh, database reports and book reports. We also have our friendly guides to count for publishers. Uh, and they're in a number of languages as well. And they provide publishers with the information they need to uh, implement counter. So again, if you have publishers or vendors who aren't counter compliant, you can tell them that there are those guides there. And of course, we're always happy to help them as well. Results, result clicks and record views, that's that metric in the database reports that uh, gives, gives us all a bit of a, a, a kerfuffle. Uh, we have a guide to, uh, to those two metrics, and I've given you the link there. And as I said, that's quite a long thing to, to explain, uh, but uh, I do recommend having a look at that guide if you are a little confused about those two metrics. So I think that brings us um, back to the end. Uh, somebody asked if I could describe the journal report 1A again. Adele, do you want me to go back to that? Uh, yes, please. Yeah, let's just go back to that one because that is the most important one. Oops, sorry. Yeah, some of them seem to load, take a while. Yeah, later. there's a bit of a, a delay. So, um, oh yes, it was Suzanne uh, who, who asked about this. This is, um, Suzanne, really the most useful report in terms of the journals. Um, and as I say here, the example we have is for a whole year. We have the uh, list of titles, the publisher, the platform, the journal deal, so all the identifiers for the journal at the title level the DOI, the ISSN, the online ISSN, uh, all to help you identify the journal. Yeah, we have to... I'm sorry. Uh, oh, yes. Report 1A. Oh, 1A. Beg your pardon. Ah, sorry. No, that's I, be I beg your pardon, um, Suzanne. The number of... Ah, oh, right. The number of... Ah, oh, oh, yes. Sorry. I beg your pardon, uh, Suzanne. I've got a red... Uh, misread your thing there. Yes, this is a very important report. Sorry, I should have spoken uh, more about that. Many publishers uh, will have two, two types of subscriptions. One will be to the current content, and you may also have a separate subscription, or you may have licensed in perpetuity the archive for that, um, for that publisher. So when you look at the JR1 report, you will be seeing the total use for the journals from that publisher. But you will have paid for the archive separately. So very often people want to eliminate the archive use and look at the use just of the current content. So the um, 1A uh, gives you the use of the archive, as we call it, uh, and you can deduct that really from, from current use. D does that make sense? I hope so. Okay. So Adele, do we, do we want to move on to the other questions? Yes. Um, I'm working on putting the link. Someone's asking for the links to put into chat. So All right. I'm okay. Shall I go back to, oh yeah. 
We okay. also have a question from Jen. If a person downloads an entire book, is each chapter counted in BR2, or is the use only recorded in BR1? Yeah, uh, that's a very important point. We are very uh, strict that the use can only re be reported once. So if the use is in BR1, it will not appear in BR2, because otherwise you would be getting sort of a double count. So if it's in, downloaded in its entirety, it will be in BR1, and it will not appear in BR2. OK, thank you. And uh, will the slides be emailed? Is it OK to share your slides? Yes, absolutely. Please do. OK, and that should cover the link issue then. <laughs> <laughs> If anybody has any questions, feel free to put them into the, uh, the Q&A area. Um, I do have a question for you, Lorraine. Um, yes. Um, is there any work being done, I may have missed it, on like streaming video, measuring that? Does that go into this at all, or is it just journals and books? No, I didn't really talk about the multimedia uh, at great length because uh, I focused on the reports that are most often used. Mm -hmm. We do have multimedia reports. Um, for both downloads and streaming of multimedia, uh, which is the MR1 uh, report. And again, uh, that will be slightly different in, uh, in release five, we think. It, it will be a sort of another type of download because increasingly platforms are providing, you, you know, once you'd go to a platform for multimedia and you'd go to another platform for full text. But increasingly, um, many platforms are having all those media types. Um, so that will be refined, in fact, in, in release five. But certainly at the moment in release four, yes, we, we have the uh, multimedia reports um, for downloads or streaming of multimedia. OK, thank you. OK, anybody else have any questions? Oh, uh, looks like Jan. Um, she's you mentioned the book reports are for books downloaded online. What about ebooks that users read online? Are they counted in the stats report? Um, I see what you're saying. No, these these reports are giving you the downloads. Okay. Okay, and is there a link that explains details of counter reports? Yes, that's your. Uh... That that you will find that if you uh, go to the friendly guides, um, as I said, there are three guides that will give you the details. So the library guides, uh, there is one for general reports, one for books, one for databases. But I would also recommend as well reading our friendly guide, which is more or less aimed at publishers, but it it does give you a breakdown about what each type of report means, and it's a very, very useful report. So that link there uh, to the friendly guides uh, uh, will, give, will, will, will help you. OK, and uh, from Suzanne, when is the next version being released? Do you have a time? Oh, good, good question, Suzanne. Uh, we are, our technical working group is uh, working now on the first draft of release five. And we will have that ready for community consultation uh, at the beginning of January. And I hope uh, I hope we can work with NASIG as well to uh, to spread the word about that. Uh, and we will be seeking uh, community feedback where we can. Where we would try and do face to face or webinars to take the feedback. Um, but we will also be running a survey, and we will have a consultation period of three months uh, to get everybody's feedback on that draft. The technical group will take on board the feedback, create a, a revised draft, which we aim to publish in June or July next year, 2017. And publishers and vendors will then have an 18-month period in which uh, we would ask them to uh, comply with the, the, the new release. Thank you. 
Um, we have a question from Damien that I'm very interested in learning about, too. Uh, can you describe in very rudimentary terms how sushi works? My oh, my goodness. <laughs> well, <laughs> not, not really. I'm not a technical person. Uh, it, it is the protocol uh, which uh, enables this machine-to-machine -machine, uh, harvesting of the usage statistics. Uh, so if uh, sushi is implemented in a library consortia, for example, uh, you can send out um, requests and download all the usage statistics for, uh, for a consortium, for example, in a machine-to-machine -machine when it's very quick. And of course, a number of the uh, library information systems also use sushi. Um, but it is really quite technical, um, and I wouldn't be able to give you that sort of detail. I think I think this is a, a technical person asking. Um, I would say no, the NISO um, website has great information, but also if you are thinking about uh, implementing Sushi and you really would like some more detailed report uh, support and information, please send me an email, and I will put you in touch with Paul Needham, who is chair of our technical advisory group. He uh, actually wrote the protocol, I think, and, and is the world's greatest expert in sushi. And he is always delighted to help people who are implementing or thinking of implementing sushi. So yeah, do drop me a, a, an email, and uh, I'll put you in touch with him. OK, thank you. Um, we have another uh, from Marie. She's asking again, when can we expect Counter 5? Um, but is there an average time we wait for publishers to catch up? Uh, well, uh, I, I think sometime, well, as I say, we will have an 18 month period from the summer of next year in which we will uh, require all publishers to comply. Um, sometimes, of course, if a publisher is planning major work on their platform, they will try to schedule that work in with, with the uh, upgrade to their platform. Or again, if they're moving platform, they won't, or they plan to move platform, they'll wait until they make that move to um, move to counter five. So we will be doing a lot of work to support the early adoption uh, by publishers and vendors of release five. Uh, I'm working with them very hard, but I think we will see uh, a period when they, um, and I think we saw this with release four, some will be very quick to come in, others will take a little longer. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. Question from Mandy, uh, you mentioned that federated and automated searches are misleading. Can you please explain this a bit more as I'm not clear why we have recorded this stat in the past? Yes, I think uh, in release four, uh, the result clicks and record views were introduced because it was generally considered that database uh, reports were becoming inflated. Because with a federated search, that search will be carried out. You know, if the user puts in a, a search, in a federated search, that will go across all, you know, many, many, many databases. So it gives an inflated view of the use. So we were very keen to uh, remove that inflated use and give you, librarians, an idea of the user action. So uh, in release uh, four, our current release, that is why there is this new metric type record views, result clicks, and the regular searches, which uh, separates out those user actions from the machine actions. I hope that, that makes sense. OK. Um, there's a question over in chat, a couple of them, actually. Um, All right. I'm not sure if you answered this. Will Counter 5 include a multimedia report for access denied turnaways? I'm not sure. Oh, yeah, I will. I, I very much hope so, actually, because there's huge demand for that. Uh, and it has come up very, very frequently as, as something people would like to see. So, yes, I, I very much uh, hope and plan that it will. OK. And what is the biggest complaint, if any, about Counter 4? Uh, I, I, think, um, I th think the biggest complaint is that 
sometimes the code of practice is difficult to understand and is slightly ambiguous. Um, so with release five, we are doing a lot of work to really make sure that there are no ambiguities. And um, we, we will be using experts to help us write the code and on the web presentation so, so that we get rid of those ambiguities. I, I, I think that is the, the, the biggest sort of bugbear really of release, release four. Um, I think as well, those result clicks and record views in the database reports were also a bit of a problem. Uh, and I think again, you know, this is counter's fault. I don't think we really did enough to explain why those new metric types were, were there and what, why they had been, um, uh, you, you know, why federated search had, had been separated out. So um, again, I think this is, shows the importance with the releases of good communication about the changes, what they mean, and why uh, they have been done. So that is why we uh, created the guide to, to the uh, result picks and record views. But I think uh, very important for us in Counter to take that lesson and say, if you're going to introduce new metric types, you have to explain to people why you have done it. So I hope I hope you will find uh, more explanation uh, in Release Five. Okay, thank you. And um, finally, it looks like there's one more question, and they're just asking about the benefits of counter uh, membership. Right. Well, uh, the benefits of counter membership. Um, first of all, I would say uh, that counter is only possible because of its members. So, you know, membership. Uh, the first benefit is it, it enables us to uh, exist. We are a membership organisation, and the membership fees are are where where uh, our income comes from. We don't need very much income, but we do need a little. So helping counter is one, one sort of benefit. Uh, but I think um, really the other benefit is the involvement in counter. And as I say, we have consultations with our members. We The members are able to vote at our AGM. Uh, uh, that's our annual general meeting. And this year we will be having that by webinar. So. Um, Previously, you know, you had to attend in person, which was limiting. Uh, everyone can vote at that meeting. And also, as a member, you are uh, eligible to serve on, sorry, with a benefit, but you are eligible to serve on our committees and our technical groups. But that is important because it means as a member, you have a say in counter uh, and you have a say in the code of practice. Uh, a few other member benefits as well that we are developing. Or, uh, if you are a member, you can log into our secure area. You will find guides there. You will also find a forum uh, that hasn't been used a great deal yet. It's a new thing we have. But I think with Release 5, it will be a really good uh, resource for understanding the new metric types and so on. So I hope that we can give our members uh, some, some special benefits in that way. Okay, thank you very much. Um, is there one more question? Do we have time? Oh, okay. May we have your email address again, please? Oh, yes. Let me give that, that to last you. Last slide. Yeah. It's also. Oh, of course, it's gone. Yes. Yeah, so we are Lorraine dot at counterusage dot org. Uh, it's also on the counter website. And please do contact me. Uh, we're really always pleased to hear from you. Uh, and have your feedback and involvement, uh, even if it's negative. It's all good uh, to hear it. It helps us improve. So, so. And of course, if you've got questions you want to follow up on, uh, please do send me an email. We'll be delighted to hear from you. That's great. Lorraine, thank you very much. We, this was very informative. I really appreciate your time. And um, everyone, this will be recorded. We're recording this, so we will send you the recording. And we will share the slides also. Well, thank you very much, Dal. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. And also to all the attendees. And I really appreciate you listening and your questions. Yes, thank you very much for coming, everyone. And I guess we'll close here. And we're looking forward to seeing you with a new, another NASIG webinar. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you.